It's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tim Jeanette. Hey everyone, Tim Jeanette, the Metal Meeple, and in this video we're taking a look at Spartacus, a game of blood and treachery. This was published by Gale Force 9 in 2012, designed by Aaron Dill, John Kowalski, and Sean Swigert, and the artist is Charles Woods. Just want to throw out some uh, thanks to these artists out there. It's for three to four players, takes about 150 minutes, and uh, it's basically, it's based off the show Spartacus, so if you're coming here looking for like a comparison, I apologize. I've never actually seen the show, but I really like the concept. You basically go through buying equipment and making and breaking deals with each other and then fighting each other to the death in the arena. So let me show you all the components, how it plays, and we'll come back and I'll tell you what I think. So I won't go over every rule, but let me show you the general idea of the game. Everyone rolls a die, the highest player is going to receive host, and choose one of these four player boards. The player boards will give you different starting assets, such as starting gladiators and slaves and gold and guards. And on top of that, you're going to have two special abilities that you can use through the game. The bottom special ability is usually to discard something to gain influence, in which case you need to win the game. The top one does different things as well. Then you determine how long you want the game to last, because in order to win, you need 12 influence at the end of any phase. You start the game with four. Now, you could play a short game at seven or a long game at one, but other than that, you're ready to begin. The first phase of the game is the upkeep phase, in which case you're basically going to gain money and heal wounds. You gain a, do a gold per slave, and you pay a gold per gladiator. In this starting setup, we basically break even, but let's just say somebody was injured, like the slave, you simply just roll a die, and on a 4+, plus, you heal them of it, and you can use them. The reason that's important is because some of them might have abilities that you can exhaust and face them down and, and gain that ability. Otherwise, they remain injured, or if you roll a 1, they permanently die and are removed from your, from your roster. After that, you go on to the Intrigue phase, in which case each player draws three cards from this massive Intrigue deck, and they're ready to begin. So, starting with the player with the Host marker and going clockwise, each player will play as many cards as they would like. Now, let's just say I had these cards. In order to play a card, you must equal or exceed your influence on the card. So, in order to play this 7, I have to at least have a 7 influence. Well, I don't. I could play this 4, in which case I would give minus 1 influence to target Dominus, but then I have to pay another Dominus 3 gold and make, a, make an enemy. So, don't really want to do that, in, the, in which case you could sell it to the uh, game for 2 gold by putting it face up in the discard pile. The next thing you could do, though, let's just say, okay, well, I, I do want 5 gold, but I don't have 7 influence. You can ask for support from somebody, in which case they lend you their influence value to add to yours. Now, anytime you play a card, you actually don't move your influence token. You just have to meet that requirement. So I can say, hey, Bob, I'm going to gain five gold for this card. I will give you two of the gold if you lend me your influence. He can say, sure. Well, I don't really have to show him this, so I can actually be lying. But let's just say I'm not. And um, he says, I'm going to lend you my support. So now I've got eight influence. I can meet the requirement of seven, give him two gold, and keep three for myself. And I can keep going because this never moves. Now I do lose the support, so I have to ask to support every card that I play. Other than scheme cards, which are these blue cards, there's also foil, or I'm sorry, reaction cards, which are red. You cannot receive support for these. You have to have a natural value, but these allow you to usually foil schemes that people are playing because you may a lot of the schemes will allow you to gain influence, and you may not want that to happen. So I could discard a ready slave to foil a scheme. There's a different one. Some of them just say foil a scheme. Other than that, there are guard cards. And as you remember on the special abilities on your player board, you might need guards to do different things such as gaining influence, but sometimes you also want to use them to protect yourself. So if somebody plays a scheme versus you, you can discard a guard to have a 50% chance of foiling that scheme. After each player passes, you must at least have a uh, drop down to your hand size based on your player board or your influence track, and then you're ready to go on to the next phase, which is the market phase, and we're going to move all this stuff out of the way and put the main board out. This is pretty much going to be in the middle of the table. This is the arena board. At that point, you're going to go through this market deck, and you're going to draw four cards to put face up on the table. Or, I'm sorry, a card per player, so we're just assuming we're playing with four people. And then 
up until now your gold is not secret but everybody's going to take their gold and put it in their hands and then you're going to do a bidding phase so we reveal the first card which in this case it's a weapon this weapon can be attached to a gladiator to give him an attack range of two normally you have to be adjacent so everybody's going to choose how much gold they want to spend on it put their fist out in the middle of the table and bid Whoever bids the most will lose all their money to the bank. Everyone else receives their money. If there's a tie, you put your gold down on the table and you bid again until there's no tie or everyone bids zero. If, anybody ever, if everyone ever bids zero, the card is discarded. You're going to do this four times. And at the end of the fourth time, you're ready to go on to the bidding of the host. In which case, you put this in the middle of the table and you bid just like you would for the cards. Let me show you some of these market cards, though, while we're at it. A lot of them are going to be, you know, slaves and gladiators. Some of these gladiators, they have different stats, which we'll go into in the combat phase next, but they have special abilities. You get, that's a starting one. You get, uh, let's see, what's, where's a slave? Here's a slave. Some of these slaves can do different things, like this one in the intrigue phase. You can exhaust to gain two gold. You just put it face down. There are weapons and armor, such as you saw the trident here, which gives you attack range of two. The armor will actually reroll de defense dice this uh, weapon you can deal one wound after resolving it so there's some pretty cool stuff here this is how you get a lot of the stuff you're going to need in the arena phase so after the market phase you go on to the arena phase the beginning of the arena phase whoever received the host marker from the market phase is going to immediately gain an influence then they are going to invite people to the games they choose one player to invite including themselves and they say hey bob why don't you come into the games and bring a gladiator in which case he picks one of his there's uh, four models to the game. The game says to pick one of these for the whole game. We usually just pick them as we play the arena matches, kind of matching their little armor and being thematic about it, but whatever. So he's going to say, sure. He puts his character on this Roman numeral one here. And then he's going to, let's just say he brought this starting gladiator. And he equipped him <clears throat> with that axe. The axe allows it to exhaust to deal one wound after resolving attack. He can have one weapon, one armor, and one special. After that, he said, uh, the host is going to say, Hey, uh, Steve, why don't you join in on this? Now, you could decline, but if you decline an invitation to the games, you're going to lose one influence. So he doesn't really want to do that. So he also brings his starting gladiator. He chooses a model or whatever and puts him on Roman numeral 2. And he's going to give him this special attack here, this javelin. Once that happens, players are ready to begin bidding. You're going to take these bidding markers that you started the game with, these little circles, and you could put up to three gold underneath of them and put them in the corners of the board. So just to show you what these are, for instance, down here, this means that you're bidding on whoever is in Roman numeral one, which is the first invite. If they win, you're going to receive your one-to-one uh, -one ratio. You would get your three gold back or whatever you bid and you get the same amount. So I would receive three more gold if, if that happened. There's also a space for the number two player. There's a space for if somebody becomes injured, which we'll talk about. And the last thing is if somebody becomes decapitated, meaning they lose all their hit points in combat. Now you're pretty much ready to begin the combat. <clears throat> At this point, you generate your dice pools. We have three stats. We have the attacking stat, the defense stat, and speed stat. And that total number is how many hit points you have and how many dice you have. So he has two, three, and two. So you have seven hit points for this guy. This gladiator up here has three, two, and two. Now let me zoom in just a hair, actually. To begin, each player is going to roll their initiative value, which is their blue dice. The higher player picks. So... This player can choose to go first or second. He chooses to go second. During your movement or action phase, you can move and attack or you can attack and move. So this guy is going to move and you move equal to the number of blue dice you have left. So he's going to move two and he can't attack anybody because he's not adjacent. So this guy is going to say moved. He's only moved two as well. So he moves up two. Then that's one round because each player has taken an action. Each player is going to roll again for their initiative. And he wins on initiative this time. So he's going to choose to go first. Before he does that, actually, he's just going to use this to exhaust and do a speed attack of range four. 
So he exhausts that. I probably should have done that first, but whatever. Speed attack at range four. He's going to roll that. And the, the way attacking works is you roll dice and you stack them up. So this player is going to roll his defensive dice. <clears throat> and you compare them. So defender wins ties, but this breaks that. Defender wins this tie. So he's going to receive one wound. He's going to block one. And this does nothing. If it's an uncontested dice of three or more, it will do a wound. But in this case, it was the defense dice, so it doesn't really matter. Anyway, so he's going to receive a wound, <clears throat> in which case he's going to take his pull of dice and lose one. So he chooses to lose it to his defense. All right, so this guy's going to go. He moves up, and he's going to swing at him. We're going to roll the attack dice. We got two fives. This guy rolls his defense dice. We got a four and a two. That's two wounds. This character is going to remove two of his dice. Let's just say he moves it from his speed. Now you can never drop below. You have to at least have one of each die. So he drops that, and let's say he drops that. And we keep going. Eventually, somebody's going to run down to zero of one stat. If you are ever at like that, with one stat being at zero, you are defeated. But you don't. there's really nothing bad that happens to you, possibly. If you lose a second stat, then you are injured. An injury occurs, and you receive one of those injury tokens from the beginning. And if you lose all three, you are decapitated. Now, barring the fact that you're decapitated, if you're injured or you're just yielded the battle, the host can decide if you live or die with a thumbs up or a thumbs down. He can accept bribes during this time or whatever, and that's really some of the fun of it. But whoever wins is going to receive a favor token and an influence. They'll get an influence and they'll receive a favor token for the gladiator who won. The favor tokens allow you, when you bring them in future battles, they gain two gold per favor token. If they ever get a third one, they actually get a champion token. And um, if, the, if he loses and the host tries to kill him with a thumbs down, the host actually loses one influence per favor token, but he can't actually thumbs down a champion. Anyway, after that, you pretty much uh, will begin the, the game again with the upkeep phase, and you keep going until somebody hits 12 influence at the end of a phase. Now, if two or more players actually get 12 influence at the end of a phase, they go into an arena battle in which we just do this, and whoever wins, wins the game. Uh, the tricky part is when like three players get into the, uh, the tiebreaker, then the two people with the lowest amount of gold, I believe, actually fight against each other and then they play the, the the other person and then whoever wins that match if everyone happens to have 12 at the end of the phase then you do the two lowest gold and the two highest and then they, they fight each other and stuff so that's pretty much the tiebreaker so let's let's talk about what i think so there you go that's spartacus now the thing you'll notice that i kind of briefed over is the fact that you can make and break, break deals gold can exchange hands at any time this makes the game either really, really fun or really annoying for some people. If, you're, if your group likes stuff like Cosmic Encounter and nothing personal, where you're constantly making deals and people can back out of those deals and then end up turning on you and things like that, you're going to love this game. I mean, the game is just really built for that. I mean, that's pretty much the ground uh, basis of everything, the foundation everything's laid on. Uh, the rest of the game is awesome. The only problem is it is a little long. We always start at 7 which is the short game, but the problem with that is when you're at seven, you don't have that time to build those those alliances with other players because you can pretty much play whatever you need up until maybe one or two cards. When you play a longer game, when I'm talking longer, it's like super long. I mean, we could play a game in like an hour and a half, or three, two hours or something, and then like you're talking three hours, four hours if you get the right amount of people, and they're just kind of slow at things, but. If you play a shorter or a longer game with lower influence, you have a lot more time to build up in allies throughout the game and you know have those fun moments where people are helping you out and it's even better when you stab them in the back you know three or four turns from then. So pretty cool. The um, there are some bad words on the game. Uh, the the box actually has mature content and it says recommend it 17 plus. Now, honestly, I think that it's really just kind of, I mean, there's blood on the board or whatever, but I think there's a few curse words, like on the box and maybe some flavor text. But other than that, it's not that huge of a deal. I think Board Game Geek users suggest like a 14 age range, but, you know, take that into your parental uh, ideas or whatever you want to do with that. Now, the combat in the game is by far probably 
uh, the weakest thing about it. I love all the phases to it, but the combat just doesn't really seem that tactical to me. Now I am coming from a huge miniature games perspective as far as like War Machine and things like that. So I really like the tactical maneuvering and everything. And I feel like this game, you kind of just, you just run and beat each other in the middle of the table and whoever rolls good, you know, wins. And I've seen it to where like a starting gladiator actually takes out a heavier gladiator who's got like three pieces of equipment on him. So it's very rare, but it's possible just because of the luck of the dice or whatever. But the tactical moving around, for the most part, everyone's hitting adjacent. So why would you move around, right? I mean, I guess you can hit and then move, and then they can move slow, and then you can move in and hit them, but then they're going to hit you. So, I don't know. There's a couple. There's a, the javelin where you can get a ranged attack going. That's pretty cool. But it's also kind of broken sometimes because you can just move in and immediately hit them for tons of damage, and then they have to take it away from, I don't know. It's whatever. For the most part, it's not that big of a deal based on everything that happens throughout the game. So it's, it's just really fun. The biggest complaint I have about the game, though, and I, it sounds like I'm harping on this game, but I really aren't, am not, this part might just be based on your group. Now, the ending to the game I do not like. When you hit 12 influence, you know, the game will end or possibly end in a tiebreaker, and that's kind of whatever. It's kind of thematic. You go into the arena and beat each other to death and see who comes out on top, right? The problem is when you're at like 10 influence or 9 or 11, people are just holding those cards in their hand to do everything they can to stop you. It turns into this munchkin thing where, you know, when you're right about to win, it's really like the second place person who ends up taking the lead because everybody just hammers the first place person down into oblivion once they say, oh, I'm winning. So I don't know. I think that's not really the fault of the game. It's just more or less the idea of the game and, and how the players approach that. So sometimes we've played with groups where people are just kind of like, well, I didn't save anything until then. Some people are saving that one card the entire game to do that. It's just very annoying. Kind of wish that maybe you can get above 12 and then players who are above 12 go in, you know, who, you know, if they're tied at that point. But it'll stop you from hitting 12 and always just taking one back. And I feel like that happens once or twice and it'll just drag out the game really long. So backtracking, though, the game is really, really fun. I mean, we've played this... I don't know how many times since it's been out, and it's just always been a blast. I mean, the, the treachery that happens is really amazing. So, anyway, I, re I really recommend it, especially with the expansions, which uh, I'll do reviews for eventually. So, if you got any questions, feel free to email me at timgenet at gmail.com. Follow me on Twitter or any of the social media down below somewhere. And until next time, keep on rocking and rolling dice. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching the Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.